comrades, and uh, welcome to uh, this presentation of our report to the National Committee of, uh, uh, of uh, our Revolutionary Party. <clears throat> well, it's been a little over a year since Trump's assault on the Capitol. And while the coup failed, everybody knows the danger is far from over. Since that day in January, Trump's forces have been uh, busy holding rallies, raising money, organizing truckers to wreck the economy, terrorizing students at historically black colleges and suppressing uh, the vote. So far, some 34 states have passed laws restricting the right to vote and make no mistake, them boys have their eyes on the prize of the midterm elections. And one can only imagine what's in store for the country should they win. A question arises, just what is the Republican Party becoming? Has it been completely captured by uh, national chauvinists, uh, authoritarians, white supremacists, neo-fascists? Or does it still uh, remain a coalition? And if so, to what degree? Well, an answer was provided uh, by the uh, National Committee of the GOP itself the other day when they declared January 6th, quote, legitimate political discourse, end of quote. There you have it. They are now normalizing insurrection, normalizing counter-revolution and violent right-wing revolt. And while it's true that debate within the GOP remains ongoing with McConnell, along with uh, Mr. Pence, uh, Ms. Cheney, and uh, Mr. Romney uh, pushing back against the tide, it's also true that they are but minnows in a sea of right-wing sharks. And uh, now, this ain't the first time that the country has been surrounded by sharks, but the situation since January 6th is at an entirely new level. And the question that we're confronted with is what to do about it. Now, our history uh, suggests, as the National Committee knows, that the first thing you got to do when surrounded by fascist sharks is cast a wide net a net wide enough and strong enough to yank them sharks up out the water. And if you think about it, that's what the All People's Electoral Front and Vote is, a net of collective action wide enough and strong enough to yank fascist sharks out of the water. Participating in the reweaving of this wide net of the people between now and election day is the chief task before us. How? By joining in uh, voter registration drives, by fundraising initiatives, rallies, occupations, door knocking, picket lines, phone banking, and get out to vote efforts. Nothing uh, over the next few months could be more important. We think workers have to lead this effort. And whether they're not leading it, our party has to fight for that leadership. That's our plus. That is the role we have to play. Thus, we should have no fear in working in broad coalitions. In fact, the broader in this situation, the better. What uh, we're afraid of is what happens when we lose sight of fighting for working class leadership in these coalitions. In this regard, it is vital that narrow uh, sectarian uh, approaches be avoided at all costs. This is not an electoral coalition of, uh, or a united front of the left or of Marxist uh, parties or groups. That's not what Lenin or uh, Dimitrov was talking about. Uh, 
Indeed, if we take our cue from Lenin himself, who from 1903 through 1917 employed a domestic, that is Russian version of the popular front strategy, he based it again and again on the principle of working class uh, uh, leadership. When, when approaching this coalition work, our unity of action should be based, uh, should be bound only by the issues themselves. Let these be the only preconditions, issues. Here, the smaller the number of issues, the wider is the possibility for joint action and initiative. And joint action and initiative is key. Why? Because the unity of action is woven together by doing things like contacting neighborhood associations, the PTA, lodges, women's rights groups, environmental organization. It's stitched by reaching out at grocery stores, uh, bars, pool halls, barbershops, beauty salons, uh, at dry cleaners, picket lines, and county fairs. And it's sewn into an unbreakable thread by demonstrating, by sitting in, by writing letters to the editor, outlining the issues and supporting candidates who back them, including where possible, our own candidates from the party. Why do we go to these places? Because that's where the workers are. That's where the people reside. What's the goal when we get there? To fight for a people's agenda, um, uh, or to use Lenin's phrase, to place a working class imprint on this process. That is the uh, bare knuckled, uh, bare boned, grassroots coalition work that's necessary in the next weeks and uh, months. You know, there have been calls in some quarters to set up a formal uh, united front against fascism, united front against fascism. And, and, and in spirit, you know, we're sympathetic to that idea. But at the same time, we have to point out today that the People's Front is not a meeting. It's not uh, like a convention or an event with a specific uh, start, date, and end time. Rather, it is the living, breathing movement of the people that ebbs and flows according to need. That front was in the streets protesting George Floyd and Breonna Taylor's murder. And it was in the voter registration drives uh, during that uprising. And afterwards, it was in the march to the ballot boxes and in everything that led up to fighting Trump's attempt to uh, hold on to and seize power. And when I say everything, I mean every little thing. And that's what's needed today. And in that respect, we say that fighting against the GOP's uh, voter suppression efforts has to be one of our top priorities. We have party members and clubs in several states where voter suppression is underway. And in each of them, it is so important to get connected with the civil rights and voting rights organizations that are fighting back. In some states like Florida and Texas, the fight is in the courts. Is that enough? In Georgia, there's a well-developed uh, mass uh, voting rights movement underway. It's an effort worth studying. Did you know that several years ago, there were over 1 million unregistered voters in Georgia. It's true. And today, 95% of all who are eligible to vote are on the rolls. That's what Stacey Abrams and them accomplished. And if you can do that on the red clay of Georgia, well, you can, you can, you can do it anywhere. 
And we got to say today that this fight against voter suppression is not an issue for just for red states or, or swing states. No, if you're living in a safe state, you might uh, want to think creatively on how to lend solidarity to states and cities where voting rights are under attack. This might be by setting up a picket line uh, at a business supporting right-wing candidates or even stopping by uh, uh, for lunch or for a friendly visit. Or it might be by participating in phone banking efforts uh, or hanging a banner uh, on a bridge. Just uh, last weekend, uh, our YCL comrades in Ohio and Indiana and Chicago, they went and to the Black Rock headquarters in Chicago and they set up a picket line in support of striking uh, Alabama coal miners. That's the kind of initiative that we need to take. Uh, so go ahead, YCL. Next time, let's make it broader, but keep on doing it. The important thing is that we take initiative and that when and where we can, that we take it in concert with other organizations and activists. Our election work, whenever possible, should be with what we call the forces of political independence. That is, with organizations and movements that operate independent, independent of the Democratic Party. Most unions, for example, have their own phone banks, fundraising efforts, get out to vote drive. And the same thing is true for outfits like Indivisible, Move On, uh, DSA. And, and working with them is a great way to get to know people, build relationships, to say nothing of maybe learning a thing or two. Sometimes, and I want y'all to hear me on this, this is going to involve working with democratic campaigns. And ain't nothing wrong with that. Our position, our long-term position in this respect has not changed. We work, we work both with and outside of Democratic Party campaigns. Yeah, it's a capitalist party, but it's a party where the majority of the working class, people of color, LGBTQ folks, women, carry out their political activity. And let's be real. Let's be real. In this election, the choice is either between doing this and the sharks. And there's no middle ground. In fact, there's no ground at all. There's just water out there and there's blood in it. That is why I got to say today that our vote against fascism slogan in 2020, it was so important. We called it back then, we did, and we gave it a name. And while everybody else, or nearly everybody else was equivocating, uh, they said, nah, you know, Joe, it's, it's, it's not, Trump's no fascist, he's, he's pragmatic, you know? Or they said, oh no, Joe, Rosanna, it's not fascism, it's, it's something called illiberal, democracy, well, you see how illiberal their democracy was uh, on January the 6th of last year. They were illiberaling, illiberaling people with hockey sticks and bats and bear spray. Now, we caught a little flack for it. We did. Some thought that the vote against fascism exaggerated the danger. Others, mainly on the internet left, but not only, somewhere in our party, argue that it's an illusion, they say, to think that you can fight fascism by only casting a ballot. But we never made any such argument, only casting a ballot. No, our position has always been that this fight in the first place has to be carried out 
on the basis of the day-to-day -day issues facing the class. And that a fight occurs in many forms, by marches, by petition drives, in strikes, in occupations, and yes, hell yes, by voting. And yes, well, I'm saying yes, it also occurs by yes, fielding our own party candidates. We should not shy away from that. The socialist moment has not disappeared. If anything, the mass radicalization process has deepened. Let's never forget that capitalism in this country, in fact, worldwide, <laughs> is in deep crisis. And there is mass dissatisfaction with both parties. It's true. And, 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 and now's the time uh, for us to step into that breach. So let the discussion begin and let's run where we can um, and support others where we can't at the local level for school boards, uh, for community boards, for city councils, for county commissioners, and so on and so forth. Look, we got a big fight ahead. And in that fight, we do not accept the idea that a Republican victory in November is a foregone conclusion. I don't give a damn what the polls say. But I do think it's true that it's going to be uh, an uphill battle. Why? Because the situation in the country is very unstable. It is unstable and uncertain. Omicron seems to be lessening, but who knows when another uh, COVID variation with 40% of the population unvaccinated, who knows when another COVID variation uh, might uh, hit us. And, 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 and then there's the overall conditions of life faced by our working class. I mean, it's true, unemployment is lower, but because of inflation, we still can't even break even. And as a result, workers are st uh, still striking when they can, and resigning when they just can't take it anymore. Then there's the problem with the democratic platform in Congress. It's stuck. Everything from human infrastructure to voting rights. And we know who's responsible. A united front of the Republicans along with two Democrats. And, and you gotta say, an apparent lack of an uh, initiative uh, from the administration on issues like voting rights. And as a result, the mood in certain sections of the democratic, as with a small d, electorate is souring, particularly when nothing seems to change. Take the issue of police murder. Cop shot over 1,055 people last year. That's the highest number since tracking began. And that's in spite of the mass uprisings of almost two years ago. The police just don't care. And in Minneapolis, a couple of weeks ago, the murder of another brother, um, Amir Locke, has rocked that city once again. And mass protests there were ongoing, uh, despite zero degree weather. And, and, and high school students, bless their hearts, high school students, both in the city and in the suburbs, walked out. And they even went and occupied the state capitol. In spite of these protests, the cop who pulled the trigger and the acting police chief uh, had not been fired at that time, uh, this, both of which were key demands of the protesters. 
worker strikes over the last months and the beginning of yet another uprising in Milwaukee demonstrates that the people are ready to fight. They're fed up, ready to fight. But with few exceptions, leadership at the national level has been sorely lacking. What we call a crisis of inaction, of not doing anything, crisis of not doing is continuing. And it's not lost on us that this is a potentially very dangerous situation when it comes to questions of war and peace. In this regard, bipartisan support for imperialism's Cold War policies towards China, its saber rattling at Russia, and the ongoing hostility towards Cuba, Venezuela, uh, all is adding to the crisis and heightening the fascist danger. Look, the Biden administration is making a big mistake if they think warmongering and selling wolf tickets at Russia is gonna help them keep a majority in the House and Senate in November. Mr. Biden, you're dead wrong if that's what you think. The American people want peace and they want it now. And we want an end to the United States acting like it's the world's top cop. And our fight for a progressive domestic policy must be coupled with an equal fight against imperialist policy abroad. We say no expansion to NATO, uh, no deployment of troops, that, that diplomacy and peace must prevail. One of the best ways to address these issues will be by participating in the Poor People's Campaign, Moral March, and Low Wage Worker Assembly on uh, June 18th. Reverend Barber and the Poor People's Campaign is one of the few exceptions to the rule of failing to take action with both respect to the bills in Congress, I'm talking about Build Back Better, and the necessary street heat on the ground to get them passed. In light of what is happening in the country, the importance of this march uh, has grown by the day. So let's pledge today to work to convince the organizations we work with and our clubs to be in uh, 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 Washington, D.C. Uh, on that day. And in fact, I think we ought to have a contingent. And I think it should be a big one. Something like 500, 500 members of the party marching in D.C. for justice, for voting rights, and for raising the minimum wage. Can we do it? Yes, we can. Let's go to DC in June, 500 strong. And speaking of 500, did you know that 550 people joined the party last month? It's true. We're not making it up when we say that a socialist moment is still with us and that uh, radicalization is deepening. Some 3,000 have joined since September and it keeps growing. And our comrades are active. We've been busy on the picket lines of the Kellogg strike, the Nabisco strike, busy organizing in Amazon warehouses, busy marching for voting rights in DC, marching for women's rights on October the 3rd all over the country, uh, organizing uh, solidarity for strikers, uh, striking minors, demanding justice for Amir Locke in Minneapolis, and walking the line with striking graduate students at Columbia University in New York. Our young communists have oftentimes 
been helping lead these efforts, pushing us forward, taking it to the streets, giving the party visibility and life. Our People's World staff has been covering these events and more day in, week out with a reduced staff, but determined uh, nation determination to get the job done. And all of our staff workers over the past two years confronted the COVID crisis uh, with sacrifice, uh, with determination to keep our movement afloat and financially solvent. And so on behalf of the National Committee, we wanna thank everybody for all you've done. We've got a tough road ahead, but we're gonna get there. And we're gonna build this party in the process to be the robust fighting revolutionary uh, organization that it needs to be, that it must be in order to help us uh, fulfill our classes, uh, historic mission. And so we say comrades, uh, we will see you uh, on the picket lines. We'll see you on the uh, 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 strike lines. We'll, we'll see you uh, uh, on May Day. We'll see you in the election process, and we hope our comrades will run. We say run, comrades, run. Run for office, run in Chicago, run in Detroit, run in Philly, run in LA, run in Oakland, run in Houston, run where you can. Uh, and we will see you 500 strong on June 18th at the uh, Poor People's March. Until then, stay strong, stay safe, stay in the fight. Thank you for listening.